What do you think it is about Bird by Bird that affected so many people so deeply? And certainly that's true of many of your other works. But in this particular case, what do you think it is that has that type of effect on people? I think it's because I didn't try to con people into thinking that if they just got a book finished, that my agent would want to take a look at it by the end of the week and that it would almost certainly be published and that then they would, all the Swiss cheese holes inside of them would be healed and they'd be well (laughs) and they'd get that FDA stamp of approval and be validated. And then their parents would start to respect them. I said, none of that's going to happen. All of that is an inside job, but I'll tell you a funny story. When Sam's little boy, who's 12 now, was five, I was teaching his kindergarten class a writing workshop. And instead of saying shitty first drafts, I said really poopy first drafts. But after, and the kids love me. And after I was done, my little grandchild came up to me and he leaned in and he sounded like Tony Soprano. He said, oh, Nana, that was terrible. And I said, what? And he said, you told people you would teach them how to write a book, but you only taught us how to write one page. (laughs) <laughs> and that's really what I can help you do is one chapter is on shitty first drafts. I, I don't try to teach kids or grown ups how to write really, really well. I just teach them to stop not writing. I teach them to keep their butt in the chair and to write badly. And that all first drafts of any book you've ever read by the authors you esteem most began as unreadable first drafts. And I teach people to take it really small, you know, bird by bird. Is it okay if I tell the oh, story? Oh, please, that- please. I, I, I would love for you to tell the story just so okay. people know the genesis. <laughs> well, my older brother, I was like a superstar achiever in school. And my older brother hated school and he was kind of a rebel. And in California in the 50s and early 60s, in fourth grade, you wrote two term papers. One was the Sacramento paper. That's our state capital. And the other was on birds. And you had to write it all year, all semester, a paper on birds. And my brother hadn't started. It was due on a Monday. And on a Saturday, he admitted to my dad that he hadn't started. My brother was a tough guy and he he was in tears. And my dad sat down with him and put his arm around him. And he said, just take it bird by bird, buddy. You know, first you read about chickadees. And then you write a paragraph in your own words about chickadees. And then you draw a picture. And then you take pelicans and you study up on pelicans and then you write a paragraph or a passage on pelicans. I never, ever forgot that. And then years later, probably 20 years ago, so in my 40s, I heard E.L. Doctorow say that writing was like driving at night with the headlights on. You could only see a little ways in front of you, but you could make the whole journey that way. And I think that is the most profound advice I can offer anyone on any topic that you, you, you can only see a little ways in front of you and, and you can make the whole journey that way. And another, th- another thing that I think helped people when they read Bird by Bird was the chapter on perfectionism and how perfectionism is the voice of the oppressor. It's the voice of the enemy. And if you listen to it, it keeps you crazy for your entire life because because we all fall short, you know, you've written books and you think you're creating this golden and crystal palace that people can walk inside of and see all of truth and beauty and reality. And you kind of end up your books and my books, all, all of them are kind of shanty towns, you know, and like in in DC during the peace marches where people set up tents and thought it made sense to bring their dogs, you know, during the rainstorm. And that's a miracle to have written a shanty town. And so I think these ideas of not knowing what you're doing and of letting yourself do it really badly and to try to help grind down that critical voice. I'll just mention my husband's work here. He, he's uh, Neil Allen. He wrote Shapes of Truth. And the work he does with people in these Shapes of Truth is taming the inner critic. And what his position is, you're never going to get rid of it. You know, we don't get over very much here. What he does with people is he has them bring forth the inner critic and actually just put it on the table in front of him. And he he thanks them for keeping them him alive when he was six and seven because the critic kept him small and controllable. So he didn't run out into the street. He didn't swim out past his ability to stay afloat. But that at the age of 60 or whatever, we probably don't need it anymore. And so he has his clients give the inner critic 
a great new job, which might be ethical consultant for the project, so that the inner critic can go off to the library where there's an incredibly comfortable chair and a good reading light and 2,000 books, and he will sit there and read, which he loves to do, and when we need an ethical consultation, we'll come get him. But we don't need that constant, is it allowed, okay to say the F word on, oh, on the yeah. show? Oh, okay. yes, please. So in Bird by Bird, there's a whole chapter on K-fucked radio, K-F-K-D. And without a lot of help and a lot of transformation and healing, K-fucked radio is on 24-7. It's telling you how far short you're falling. It's telling you how great you started out and what a disappointment you've turned out to be. It's telling you that what you're in the middle of is beating a dead horse, on and on and on. And so the shapes of truth work and the inner critic work and Bird by Bird is 90% 90% about turning down K fucked radio. Anyway, out of the left hand speaker is all this stuff about that you, you can't do it perfectly and that why bother and that this has been blah, blah, blah. But out of the right hand speaker is the, it's like the voice of the people who love you most. The voice of like for me, Sam or my husband or my two best girlfriends. And they're saying, I love your stories. I love how you write. I can't wait to read more. So, but you can turn down the left-hand speaker and it'll always be there to some degree. 